Okay, folks. So I mentioned in Monday's lecture that one of the many things that I love about embedded systems is that they perch perfectly on the boundary between the computational world and the natural world. And the thoughts that I want to talk about today, they come as a consequence of having spent some time on that boundary. The longer that you sit there, the more that you begin to wonder the extent to which these two worlds, the computational and the natural, are in fact distinct. You begin to wonder if the natural world is fundamentally computational, and you begin to wonder the extent to which a latent computational potential that may exist in nature could be unlocked, and what the consequences of unlocking that latent computational potential could be. And so that's what I'd like to talk about today. This whole presentation begins with an observation and a question to which I do not yet have the answer. The observation is that humanity has an incredibly long history of utilizing natural processes for the production of power. And by natural processes, I mean things like the flow of water in rivers and waterfalls. I mean things like the movement of the winds and tides. And I mean things like the, the movement of photons from the sun to the surface of the earth. The question that I've been pondering is, have we been underutilizing these natural processes for computation? Does there exist a latent computational potential in these natural processes? And what would be the consequences of unlocking that, that, that latent computational potential? Um, if this computational potential exists, and if we could unlock it, and I can appreciate that those are two big ifs, I think that this could change the world in some big and positive ways. In particular, gaining access to the computational potential which may exist within nature would radically increase total global compute. If we could gain the ability to use computers that we didn't engineer, but that have instead been engineered by evolution and by physics, we would suddenly have access to a whole bunch more computational power to devote to problems of interest to us. Um, but also, and, and just as importantly, perhaps, perhaps even more importantly, I think that doing this could fundamentally and positively change the relationship between nature and machines. If we can incorporate healthy natural processes and healthy natural environments into our computational machines, it may be the case that we are incentivized to preserve these natural places, not only for some altruistic environmentalist reasons, but also perhaps for the computational potential and utility that is contained therein. And I think that that would be amazing. I want to mention before I go any farther that these are, these are baby ideas on wobbly legs. And that is to say that I don't yet know if anything that I'm about to talk about is a good idea, or if instead these are this is just a good story. And in fact, I don't even know if this is a good story. <laughs> but um, that's the reason that I want to give this presentation is to hopefully engage in a conversation with all of you about if there's anything to any of this. That is to say, I, I, I'm hoping to, with you, try to figure out which of these ideas should be allowed to mature and which of them should be sacrificed on the altar of reason. Um, and so I just want to make it very clear that I am not trying to convince you of the correctness of any of the ideas in this presentation. Now, I'm enthusiastic about them, and that enthusiasm is probably going to come through. But, but please don't mistake my enthusiasm for anything like a certainty that I'm right about this. I don't yet know if I'm right about this. So my goal is not to convince you that this is correct. Instead, my goal is to, my goal is to communicate these ideas as clearly as I can so that we can talk about whether there's anything to them or not. That's my goal. And so to that end, here's my plan. I'm going to make a claim that I'm going to, to back up a little bit. The claim that I'm going to make is that evolution and physics have produced computers, that there exist computers in nature, and that we might engage in computational naturalism, that is to say, going into the wild, much like the naturalists of previous centuries, but instead of going into the wild to look for new plants and new organisms, we would instead be looking for natural computers. And we'd be trying to understand how we might plug in our computers to these natural computers to accelerate certain processes or store data or move data. I'll talk about all these different options. <laughs> 
Um, so that's going to be the claim. Now, in order to make that claim, I need to provide a little bit of context. The first thing that we need to agree upon before we start having a conversation about these natural computers is what the hell a computer even is. And so I'd like to start by just offering a definition for what a computer is, sort of the functional definition for this presentation. And then I want to remind you of some of the more familiar flavors of computer. This is all for context. This is all just to provide you some context so that when I then present a new flavor of computer, a naturally evolved computer or a computer that is the product of physics rather than, than human engineering, um, that we can place it relative to these other flavors of computer that are perhaps, perhaps more familiar. And so that's the plan. And so the first thing to agree upon is, is what a computer is. And I'm going to offer you my definition for this, which is a work in progress. I'm not sure that this definition is perfect, um, but it's the best that I can come up with at the moment. I think in order to define what a computer is, we, heard, we first have to define computation. And in my estimation, computation is the useful transformation of one quantity or one quantifiable system into another quantity or another quantifiable system. And the parenthetical reference to a quantifiable system there is a foreshadowing of a brief conversation that we're going to have about analog computing. So if that's what computation is, then I think a computer is anything which does computation. That is to say, a computer is anything which usefully transforms one quantity into another quantity. This is the most general definition that I can come up with. What's interesting to me about this definition, just as a, a little aside, is I do think that the word useful is required here. I think that in order for something to be a computer, the, the transformation that it's affecting must be a useful one. But what's interesting is utility depends on your application. And so if there is a thing here on the desk that is affecting some transformation of quantities, if that transformation is useful to me, then that thing is a computer for me. If it's not useful to you, then that thing is not a computer to you. And so that is to say that the answer to the question, is this a computer, with reference to some thing, is subjective. I think that thing, I, I think that half of us could say, yes, that is a computer, and the other half could say, no, that is not a computer. And it could be the case that we're all correct, because it depends on how useful the transformation that that thing is doing is for our particular application. And so we have, of course, we being humanity, we've engineered a whole bunch of different flavors of computer. And I want to just remind you of a few of those flavors so that when I introduce this new flavor, there's a little bit of context. So let me start with one that's probably rather familiar, at least you know, familiar in the sense that we use these a lot. One variety of computer is a digital computer. A digital computer represents the quantities that it transforms symbolically. And the representation varies from digital computer to digital computer. For instance, an abacus is an example of a digital computer. And the representation the abacus uses for quantities is the positions of beads on rods. Um, in mechanical digital computers, the representations for quantities may be gear rotations. And in digital electronic computers of the sort that we are all sort of most familiar with at least using, those representations are are given by bits. More specifically, the quantities are represented by voltages in latched circuits. If the voltage in the latched circuit is high, then that's a one. If it's low, then that's a low. And the digital computer transforms not the quantities, but the representations for these quantities. So if you double a quantity in a digital computer, there isn't twice as much of anything in that computer. Instead, the representation for that quantity has been transformed into the representation for twice that quantity. And I'll just mention as an aside that there are a couple of good reasons that we use voltages in latch circuits as our representations for these quantities in modern digital electronic computers. Um, the big reason that we do that is that we can affect transformations on those representations by means of logical circuits. And those logical circuits have a couple of great features. One is that Claude Shannon showed that these circuits can solve any problem that Boolean algebra can solve. And so what that means is that if we use voltages and latch circuits as our representation, and if we use these digital circuits to affect the transformations of those representations, then we can do any mathematical transformation that we care about. 
He did that in his master's thesis, by the way. <laughs> if you are interested in computing and in the history of computing, I, I cannot recommend strongly enough that you read about Claude Shannon. He's a personal hero and perhaps one of the most fascinating people that ever lived. Um, but that's a digression. So, so one nice feature of this representation for quantities is that we can affect any transformation that we care about. The other nice feature is that those transformations occur really fast. And so in contrast to something like, say, a mechanical digital computer where we have to turn some crank to affect this transformation, where the physics of the transformation relates to the physics of moving gears or something, um, the transformation in digital electronic computers that use, that use voltages and latch circuits can happen as fast as the physics of electricity, right? So it's, it's much, much faster. Um, and so in general, this is what a digital electronic computer is. It's a computer which, which represents quantities as bits. Those bits are voltages and latched circuits. And then we affect the transformations of those quantities with logical circuits. And we have at this point two general flavors of digital computer. We have special purpose digital computers. And we have general purpose digital computers. In a special purpose digital computer, we send the representation for a quantity or for a collection of quantities into this device. There is a, you might call it a hard-coded set of transformations in that device, which takes those inputs in, transforms them, and gives them the inputs and gives us inputs back out. Um, and so it, examples of modern engineered devices that do this kind of thing are application-specific integrated circuits, or ASICs, and hardware accelerators of the sort, by the way, that we'll build in 5760, if any of you are interested in taking that class. Um, these hardware accelerators, let me just mention, the way that we use these is we have some general purpose processor, which I'm going to talk about in more detail here in just a moment. It communicates quantities over to a special purpose accelerator. So that instead of doing some expensive operation on the general purpose computer, we can build custom high speed hardware that just does that expensive operation, but it does it extremely quickly. And so we send the quantities over, this accelerates the calculation of that particular algorithm, and then it communicates the results back to the general purpose CPU. I'm, I'm just pointing this out because I'm going to return to this idea when I start talking about natural computing. Okay, so we have special purpose digital electronic computers. We also have general purpose digital electronic computers. These include subsystems, and I'm simplifying here, but generally speaking, those subsystems include memory. That is to say, places that we can hold data. That data may represent quantities, you know, that we're transforming. They may, that data may alternatively represent instructions, and those instructions would be consumed and, and used by a processing unit that is um, that is changing the transformations that it's affecting on the representations in that digital computer based on whatever instruction it just read out of memory. And then, of course, there's a bus. This is some mechanism for moving data between the subsystems of the computer. And then there are likely peripherals, and these are special purpose, piece, special purpose pieces of hardware with which the the processor can communicate, but that offloads some tasks to, you know, specially designed hardware. So examples of this might be timers, serializer, deserializers, those things like, oh, USB peripherals, SBI peripherals, uh, DMA channels, this kind of thing. They do limited things, but they do those things quite efficiently. And so just as an example of this, I'll bring up this, this diagram that we've spent a bunch of time studying this semester. This is just showing us at a very high level, the internal architecture of the RP2040 microcontroller. And what we can see is there's a couple of processors up here. This plugs into a bus, the bus being the mechanism by which we can move data around between these subsystems. And then, of course, we have memory down here. We have some more memory here. We have peripherals over here, including timers, serializer, deserializers, and analog to digital converter. Right. So this is just to remind you that this is the kind of stuff that lives inside a modern general purpose digital electronic computer of the embedded variety. And I just want, I, I, like I said, I'm reminding you of these things for context because 
I want to introduce a new flavor of computer, this natural computer. And when I do so, I want to return to a few of the ideas. So just put a pin in the idea of a hardware accelerator, of memory, of a processing unit, a bus, and of peripherals, because we're going to return to those ideas. So that's what a digital computer is. There are other flavors of computer. An analog computer, rather than representing quantities symbolically, we represent the quantities physically. That is to say, with physics. And so what we do here is let's suppose that there's some system that we want to build a computer to model and understand. Perhaps it's, oh, the movement of the planets or the movement of the tides or something like that. The way that we would build an analog computer in order to study that system is we would first figure out what are the degrees of freedom in this system that we want to study and what are the equations that dictate how those degrees of freedom change with time. And what we would then do is build a different system that contains the same number of degrees of freedom and has the same set of governing equations that dictate how those degrees of freedom change with time, but over which we have control. And so one mental model for what's going on here is an analog computer is essentially studying one system with another system, and it's doing so by changing the units of the system that we're studying. So for instance, it might be the case that we're building an, an analog computer out of, say, op amps, operational amplifiers, and we're building that computer to study and model the movement of planets. Then it will be the case that the set of equations that dictate how the voltages and currents and so forth in those op amps are changing with time map directly to the equations that describe how the planets move with time. And so we're essentially changing units from position of the planet to something instead like voltage out of an operational amplifier. But the, the equations which dictate how these degrees of freedom change are the same. And then with our, with our analog computer, we can make time run forward. We can make time run backward. We can change parameter values and study what happens. It becomes an analogous system for the system that we're interested in. And this suggests some things about analog computers. These tend to be special purpose. They tend to be built for a specific purpose. Um, however, they also can be extremely fast and power efficient as compared to digital electronic computers. And so again, how do we do this? If we want to design an analog computer, we first generate an understanding of the system that we're going to model. Like I said, that's understanding what are the degrees of freedom? How do they change with time? And then we build a different system that has the same number of degrees of freedom and the same collection of equations that describe how they change with time, but which may be built, which may be built upon totally different physics, right? We may have translated the physics of celestial mechanics to the physics of operational amplifiers or whatever it may be. And so I just want you to put a pin in this idea too, because when we get to natural computing here in just a couple minutes, we're going to return again to this notion as well. And there are more, even more modern versions of computers. There exist quantum computers, which um, I don't think talking through this in tremendous detail is of direct utility to the conversation I'm trying to have here. But I will say a few things about quantum computers as they, as they pertain to the conversation that we are having. In quantum computers, like in digital computers, quantities are represented symbolically. In a quantum computer, rather than symbolically representing the, quality, the quantities that are being transformed as voltages in latch circuits, they're instead represented as the probability amplitudes of finding qubits in one of two states. And I'll just mention briefly that the power of quantum computers is all of your qubits entangle. And so every time you add another qubit to the system, you double the state space of the system. So with one qubit, you have two states. With two qubits, you have four. With three, you have eight, and so on, and so on, and so on. And by the time you have 300 qubits, you have more states, I believe, than there exist atoms in the universe. <laughs> so the state space is huge. And then what's really powerful about these things is, is you can build, humans can build, uh, quantum logic gates, which are very analogous to the logic gates that we use in digital electronic computers of the sort that Shannon investigated so thoroughly. Um, but the transformations affected by those logic gates 
act on every single state in that potentially massive superposition of qubits. And so it's a big parallel accelerator. I think that's all that I want to say about these. Um, I, if you're interested, I have some information, some really high level information here about these things. And an example of quantum computers, you know, perhaps obviously given what I just said about them, they don't like replace your laptop. They don't serve the same purpose as our general purpose um, digital electronic computers. They instead act like accelerators for certain kinds of algorithms. An example of an algorithm, perhaps kind of spookily, <laughs> that quantum computers are quite well suited for is prime number decomposition. That is to say, taking some huge number and figuring out what are the two prime numbers that are the prime factors of this big, huge number. Uh, the reason that's slightly spooky is RSA encoding is based on, it's, it relies on the fact that that's an incredibly computationally expensive problem to solve, that prime number decomposition. If it were the case that quantum computers could do this quickly and efficiently, um, we may have to, <laughs> we may have some security problems with online stuff. And so this is an area of active research is developing quantum computer developing uh, encoding schemes and algorithms that are robust to quantum computers. This is an area of active research. That, that's all kind of an aside. The point that I really want to make about a quantum computer is that it's acting like an accelerator. Remember when we were talking about digital electronic computers, I mentioned that these special purpose digital electronic computers act like hardware accelerators. There's something into which we plug our general purpose computer that is designed to do an algorithm extremely quickly. So it's not general purpose, these digital electronic accelerators, they aren't general purpose, they do a thing really quickly. So to offer an analogy, if your general purpose digital electronic computer is analogous to like a mechanics shop where you might take your car and they can solve all sorts of problems, these hardware accelerators are F1 pit stops. They can only do a limited number of things, but boy, do they do them efficiently. The quantum computer is kind of analogous to this hardware accelerator, but different in an important and interesting way. The quantum computer is behaving like a physics-based accelerator. So like the hardware accelerator, the digital electronic version, it is something into which we plug our general purpose digital electronic computer and which accelerates the computation of an algorithm. But what makes the quantum computer so different and so interesting is that the underlying mechanism by which it's doing computing is totally different physics. It's totally different physics. And I'll just mention too that this idea of using completely different underlying mechanisms for affecting certain kinds of computation and then interfacing that different kind of computing device with a general purpose computing device has since been expanded upon. And there are other, there are even more flavors of computing that are being investigated. One particularly interesting one is reservoir computing. This is related to neuromorphic computing. That is to say, computing that is modeled on our understanding of how the brain works. One of the interesting things that we seem to, uh, no worries. <laughs> one of the interesting things that we seem to understand about the brain is that the, the processing and memory units appear to be co-located. So in contrast to, we were just looking at that that system diagram for the RP2040, and you notice that the processors were up here and the memories were down here. In the brain, they seem to be all mixed. And uh, there's a bunch of research going into developing engineered computers that share this property. One example of this is reservoir computing, the idea being that you essentially just have some collection of material with interesting dynamic properties, and you can affect inputs to this material. The material affects a transformation and gives you outputs. And again, if that transformation is useful, well, then that's a computer and it can be used to accelerate whatever process it is that that transformation is affecting. Um, and then there's another flavor, which is physical computing. And that, that is to, we see this particularly in, um, oh, accelerators for things like neural nets, where the idea is that we, we may be able to implement some of the the computation required to do back propagation through a neural net using other physics. 
Um, and by the way, as I go through these slides, you'll see some names here in red. And these are just to indicate some folks here at Cornell who are working on stuff related to this. Um, Peter McMahon's working on stuff related to this, has some interesting papers about it. And so again, I'm going through all of this to provide you a little bit of context for a claim that I would like to now make. The claim that I would like to make is that in addition to engineering computers, we can go into nature and find computers and the components of computers. And we might be able to interface them with our general purpose digital electronic computers and use them in much the same way that we interface a quantum computer which are with our digital electronic computers or in much the same way that we interface those hardware accelerators with our digital electronic computers. My claim is that we can go into nature and find other examples of computers and of their subsystems. We can find examples of memory. We can find examples of data transfer. So let me just state that once more and perhaps slightly more clearly. My claim is that if you look almost anywhere in nature, you will find processes occurring that are transforming quantities into other quantities. Everywhere that things are changing in nature, which is almost everywhere, there's a transformation of a quantifiable system into another quantifiable system. To the extent that those transformations are useful, then those are computers. Those are examples of computers that have been generated by physics or by evolution or by whatever natural process it may be. If we can interface those natural sources of computation, those natural computers, with our digital electronic computers, then we, they can be used as natural accelerators in contrast to hardware accelerators or in contrast to something like a quantum computer, which is sort of an engineered physics-based accelerator. It may be the case that we can plug into these purely natural systems and use them as natural accelerators. But nature doesn't just offer sources of computation. It offers some other things that are of relevance to computing as well. Nature is replete with repositories for data, places where we could put data in natural systems without having any adverse effect on the life that inhabits those systems. And I'm going to talk about that in more detail in just a moment. But I would argue that these repositories for data exist in nature. And also, nature offers us mechanisms for moving huge amounts of data over far distances or rather quickly. And so what we're seeing here is the pieces of a computer. Remember when we were looking at the pieces of a, a general purpose digital electronic computer, that computer contained processing units, computers. It contained memory. It contained mechanisms for moving that memory en masse. And so in the limit, maybe it's the case, maybe it's the case that we can piece together these natural accelerators, natural memory, and natural mechanisms for moving data transfer into something approximating a general purpose natural computer. But that would be in the limit. In the near term, I think there are ways that we can plug our engineered computers into these natural computers, natural repositories for data, and natural mechanisms for moving data, and thereby make nature a subsystem in our computing devices. So that is to say, you know, I think that there may exist natural analogs for many of the subsystems that exist in a computing device like this. You know, for DMA, what is DMA? It's just a mechanism that, for moving data from one place in memory to another place in memory. As we'll discuss, I think nature offers mechanisms for doing that. I have nature written over processor one up there just to suggest that there exists natural processes that are doing computation. Um, I think there exist natural repositories for memory. You see, that's why I have nature written down here over uh, RAM and ROM. And I think nature also offers us things like timers and other sort of useful peripherals that you often find in a modern general purpose electronic computing device. And so I want to consider each of these different things separately. I want to consider natural computation, that is to say, natural sources of compute. I want to then talk about natural memory, that is to say, places in nature where we could put data and store it. And I want to talk about natural data transfer, natural mechanisms for moving data from one piece of our computing device to another piece of our computing device. But let's start with natural computation. If you will grant that, if you will grant that 
nature is replete with computers in the sense that nature is replete with processes that are affecting transformations of one quantity into another quantity. And that some of those transformations might be useful to you, if you're willing to grant that, then it is possible that these natural processes could be used as natural computational accelerators. But how would one go about doing that? I want to offer you a strategy. I think the way that we start to, to interface our computers with natural computational accelerators, I think we begin by engaging in computational naturalism, which I mentioned briefly earlier. But I think, much like the naturalists of previous centuries, this whole process starts by going into nature and instead of looking for new plants and new animals and new organisms and so forth, what we're looking for instead are algorithmic processes. We're looking for places in nature where quantities are being transformed into other quantities, and those won't be hard to find. And then the next thing that we do is develop a model for this system, which describes that transformations of, input, of inputs to outputs, either in a, in a detailed fashion or in sort of a black box fashion. And this second step is, is I think, very much like, um, it's very similar to the kind of process that you have to go through when you're developing an analog computer. Remember that the first step of developing an analog computer was developing an understanding of the system that you're trying to model. What are the, what are the degrees of freedom of this system? What are the equations that dictate how those degrees of freedom are changing with time? This is very similar. We're trying to understand this natural algorithmic process in a much similar way. And then finally, you develop a system by which your digital electronic computer can affect the inputs to this natural system by means of actuators or something, and, um, and then can observe the outputs by means of sensors or something. And if you can do that, you can then use that natural process to accelerate whatever algorithm it happens to be just doing, right? And so the fundamental idea here is that these are kind of like analog computers. They are analog computers that evolution and physics have built. They exist out there in the world. The claim is that rather than building analog computers, we can find analog computers. We can find these analog computers understand the transformations that they, that they perform, and then plug them into our digital electronic computers as accelerators. I recognize that that's kind of a big claim, but I would argue that there is evidence that this at least works in principle. This at least works in principle. The evidence, I think, to support that this works in principle, let, let me say that in just a moment. I, let me briefly state that these ideas that I'm talking about here, I do think that they relate to Stephen Wolfram's principle of computational equivalence. This principle of computational equivalence states that every process, including cellular automata, uh, physics, brains, all these processes can be thought of com computational, that is transforming inputs to outputs. And Wolfram's principle of computational equivalence states that once you get above a relatively low threshold of complexity, they're all doing computations of equivalent sophistication. So, you know, the claim is that our brains and thunderstorms and all of these complicated processes are doing approximately the same level of complexity computation. That's the claim. And now the question that this whole presentation is posing is, sure, can those computations be used? That's what we're investigating. I think they can. And I think evidence that this at least works in principle is our own brains. Um, we often think about our digital electronic computers as being sort of accelerators for our brain. We can offload, um, we can offload heavy computational tasks to our computers so that our brains don't have to do them. Um, but in fact, I would argue that this goes both directions. In addition to our digital electronic computers are acting like accelerators for our brains. Our brains are also accelerators for those digital electronic computers. There are certain algorithms that our brains are much more adept at doing than digital electronic computers are. And so our computers can provide inputs to our brains by means of 
screens and speakers and the other ways in which we interface our bodies with computers. It gives our brains inputs, our brains run algorithms, and then we provide the outputs from our brains algorithms back to the computers by means of keyboards and mice and microphones and so forth. And so I would argue that the brain is an example of a natural accelerator. It is a computing device that evolution and physics have created. And we have interfaced this example of a natural computer with a digital electronic computer. And we're using this natural computer to accelerate certain algorithms. So I think that this is evidence that this works in principle. And I think that there are examples beyond brains. I think there are more examples of natural computers with which we might interface. In particular, the problems to, I think, start with are those which are difficult for digital electronic computers, but are sort of, in some sense, easy for nature. So one example of this is generating randomness. Some of you, for your final projects, have discovered that generating really, truly random numbers in the pristine digital environment of an electronic computer is difficult. It's a whole area of study. But nature is really good at randomness. Nature generates randomness all the time. And so it may be the case that one of the sort of first tentative steps in this direction of natural computational accelerators is a natural random number accelerator. And there are a bunch of ways that I could imagine doing this. I'm, I'm offering you some, how to say this? I wanted to offer you some sort of concrete examples to grab onto. Um, but, but do please don't, please don't mistake a weakness of a proposed example for a weakness of the whole idea, okay? So just as an example of using nature as a natural computational accelerator for gener generating randomness, one, I think, kind of interesting way that we might do this is to use galactic cosmic rays as bus masters. Remember that in a digital electronic computer, a bus master is a subsystem in that computing device which can read and write memory. Um, and, and one way that we might use nature as a natural accelerator for random number generation is to allow nature to write to our memory. And in particular, the way that we might do this is to design our computer, design a section of memory in a computer such that it is particularly susceptible to single event upsets from high energy particles. So that is to say it's particularly susceptible to some particle coming in from, you know, way out in space, some high energy particle hitting that section of memory and flipping a bit. This is typically something that we try to avoid, uh, particularly in spacecraft, just incidentally. It's, it, it, if you're making a, a very expensive deep space spacecraft, it's often the case that those folks will use radiation hardened electronics. Those radiation hardened electronics are, are particularly robust to single event upsets. It's, it's particularly difficult for a high energy particle from the universe to come in and affect memory. What I'm proposing is well, maybe we could soften the memory. Maybe we could make that memory really susceptible to being flipped by particles that are just whizzing by all the time. And then we could generate random numbers by just reading that memory and seeing which bits have flipped. That's going to be purely random. Now I can appreciate that does this generate random numbers at anywhere near the rate at which it's useful for most of our processes? I don't know. I don't know. But all that I'm proposing is that there may be mechanisms by which we can use nature's ability to produce randomness in order to bring randomness into our pristine digital electronic computers. Um, in addition to generating randomness, nature is also quite good at periodic processes. If you, if you, look around in nature, you will find examples all over the place of synchronization. Um, this occurs uh, last semester, for instance, we did a synchronization lab where we were, synth we were synthesizing cricket sounds and then having those crickets synchronized with one another, just like they do here in Ithaca. But synchronization occurs all over the place. Um, it occurs down in the Great Smoky Mountains among the fireflies. It occurs, like I said, among snowy tree crickets here in Ithaca. It occurs in the pacemaker cells in the heart. It occurs in sections of the brain. All over the place, there's synchronization events. It's possible, maybe, that we could use some of these synchronization events as timers in our 
digital electronic computers if only we can interface our electronic computers with these events that are occurring in nature. I think there's some ways that we could. As perhaps a silly example of this, you know, one example of, of a periodic process that is occurring at some rate is, um, this is a really silly example, by the way, is uh, the visitation rates of birds to bird feeders. This is just an example that, this is from staring out my backyard at a bird feeder <laughs> and noticing that birds are coming, oh, about every five minutes, 10 minutes. Um, and so, you know, just as a, uh, a possibly silly example of the benefits that may come from bringing nature into our computers is maybe instead of keeping a timer on in our system that we have deployed, you know, out in the field to take measurements and thereby consuming battery life, maybe we could turn the system completely off and use one of these periodic processes that is occurring in that part of nature to wake the system back up. Maybe a bird comes and pecks the bird feeder, which turns your whole embedded system back on, which makes it take an environmental measurement and go back to sleep. And yes, you've sacrificed high fidelity. You've sacrificed certainty in knowing the frequency with which measurements would be gathered. But what you've gotten back, perhaps, is extended battery life. And so again, that's a niche application, but there, I think that there do exist these applications where even some of these relatively low hanging fruit opportunities add value. And I wanna to mention too that, that, yeah, there's some folks here that are working on stuff related to this. I wanna to mention too that low hanging does not necessarily mean low impact. If you think in particular about this notion of trying to use nature as a natural random number generator, an accelerator for random number generation. Um, I would contend that random number generation is one of the most important algorithms to start thinking about optimizing for things like energy consumption. Um, the, and the question here is, you know, if you think about total global compute, that is to say, think about all the instructions that are being executed on all the computers on the whole planet every second and ask yourself, what algorithms are most of those instructions devoted to performing? Um, I don't yet have the evidence to back this up. This is a hypothesis. But I have a suspicion that a remarkable fraction of total global compute is dedicated to Monte Carlo analysis of one kind or another. And in each of those Monte Carlo analyses, every turn of the crank of that Monte Carlo analysis requires the generation of a random number. And so what, you know, how much energy could we save if instead of generating these random numbers in these digital electronic computers, we made use of some natural process that did this for us? This is a thought experiment, okay? But this is all just to say that even these relatively low hanging things might not necessarily be low impact. And then in the long term, you know, so that, that was sort of the near term possibilities for natural computational accelerators. What about long term possibilities? Well, there are some things that nature is really good at. Nature is so good at doing things in parallel. I've been thinking about this a whole lot recently because as a, as a personal project last year, um, I implemented an, a lattice Boltzmann accelerator on an FPGA. The lattice Boltzmann algorithm is a, um, it's, um, a solution to the Navier-Stokes equations. And so it describes how fluid flows. So you can implement a, a lattice Boltzmann simulation and it will generate really pretty animations of fluid flowing over a boundary and generating vortex sheets and interesting turbulence patterns. Um, and the thing that got me thinking so much about nature's ability to do things in parallel is that was hard, that, and that took, you know, four weeks, and after all that work, and using every ounce of the computational ability that the FPGA could have to offer, I was able to animate about this much of the VGA screen, a tiny little section of the VGA screen. Meanwhile, nature's just doing this all the time and everywhere. Fluid is just flowing, and all these crazy patterns are just forming and occurring. It's doing all this computation in parallel. Um, and so maybe 
maybe it's the case that for some computational physics experiments, we may be able to substitute sensors and actuators for parallelized computers. So this is sort of a version of analog computation, but what makes it different is we aren't building an analog computer. We're using an analog computer that's already built by nature. That's the thought. So that is to say, we aren't building, we aren't engineering an analog for a process of interest. What we're doing instead is identifying computational processes that are just occurring in nature. And then we're trying to identify analogous problems with that, which that might be used to solve. Okay. Nature's also really good at optimization. It's really good at optimization. And is it possible if we engaged in this computational naturalism effort, could we go find examples of natural systems that are solving things like the knapsack problem or the traveling salesman problem or other NP hard problems? And can we gently influence those natural systems to solve a version of that problem that's of interest to us? And there's a famous and perhaps cliche example of this, of, of researchers in Japan using a slime mold to optimize the rail system. The rail system was already designed as far as I understand, but, but they conducted this experiment and realized that the slime mold properly set up came up with exactly the same layout um, for that rail system. It optimized for the same kinds of things. And then I'll just mention too that I don't think that we've yet to fully realize the potential of the brain as a natural accelerator. I think that with a better understanding of the brain's API, and with higher bandwidth communication between our brains and digital computers, we'll begin to be able to not only use those computers as accelerators for our brain, but better understand how to use our brains as accelerators for those computers. And I'll mention one more long-term possibility. It's, it's conceivable, I think, that in the future, that life itself could be used as a natural computational accelerator. One model for life, an overly simplified model for life is life is a function, a highly nonlinear function, which takes its environment as an input and gives a transformed version of its environment as an output. So if life exists in some environment, it is modifying its environment in some complicated nonlinear way all the time. A thought experiment is, you know, that life is highly complicated, highly nonlinear. It's doing these crazy transformations of its environment. But if you take life and you linearize it about a moment in time, linearize life about a moment in time, life becomes a matrix that acts on a vector. The vector that it acts on is a big, long vector that specifies every degree of freedom in the environment that that life occupies. Life takes that vector as an input, modifies it, it changes its environment, and it gives a new vector as its output, a transformed version of its environment. If we could understand the transformations that life is doing, we may be able to use life as a computational accelerator by gently affecting its environment and then observing the transformed version of its environment that life has, has affected and using those transformations as our computations. And there are people here at Cornell that are studying exactly this kind of thing. This, this couples, I think, a lot with studies of swarm behavior and emergent phenomena and so forth. I'm going to come back to this idea, by the way, when I talk about natural memory. And so this whole idea is that it might be possible, instead of engineering computers, particularly analog computers, that we can go into nature and find these computers. We can find analog computers that nature has already created, and then we can identify other processes that are well modeled by the behavior of that system that we've found. One way of putting this is this whole philosophy takes advantage of the fact that nature has a habit of reusing her mathematical models. There are lots of systems, for instance, that implement some version of the wave equation. And so if you, if you go into nature and you find some highly observable example of a system that for which the wave equation is a critical part, but for which you have an exceptional ability to observe that system, that system may be used as an analog computer to study other systems that are also based on the wave equation. 
some natural or some perhaps that are just of interest to humans, sort of non-natural computational problems. This is not easy, obviously, obviously. Um, there are some problems to solve in order for this to be practical. I think one of those problems is we need fast input-output between our engineered computers and these natural computers. If we want to use a natural process as a computational accelerator, then the relevant times that we are comparing, we're comparing the time that it takes for our normal engineered digital electronic computer to compute that algorithm. We're comparing that time against the time that it takes for that computer to send information over to the natural system, for that natural system to do its thing, and then to communicate that information back to our, our engineered uh, computer, which is just to say that the time that it takes to send information into these natural systems and to get information back from these natural systems is in the picture. And so in order for these accelerators to be useful, the input output between nature and machine has to be fast. And so I think this is one of the problems to solve in order for this to be, to be uh, practical. We need to be able to affect those natural systems quickly, and we need to be able to get information back from them quickly. And then the other problem to solve, of course, is we need to generate understandings of the transformations that these natural computers are affecting. And for some natural systems, that may be relatively simple. And for others, it might be incredibly hard. So this, this seems to me like another challenge to solve. So this is, all, this is all a description of the mechanisms by which we might use natural processes as computational accelerators. We might go into nature, find examples of computers that evolution and nature have built, and plug our computers into those natural processes. But nature does not just offer computers. It also offers memory. It also offers memory. In nature, there are a tremendous amount of environments with degrees of freedom that are effectively invisible to the inhabitants of that environment. So one way to think about this is, remember the, the highly oversimplified model for life that I offered a few slides ago, was life is some crazy nonlinear function that takes its environment as an input and gives a new environment as an output. And if you linearize that crazy life function about a moment in time, you end up with a matrix. And my argument is that I will bet you that that life matrix has a huge null space. That is to say, there are a bunch of degrees of freedom in that long vector that specifies the environment that are effectively invisible to the life that inhabits that environment. And we are free to store data, a lot of data, perhaps, in that null space without having any adverse effect on the life that inhabits that space. Just to give you a, a, an example of what I'm talking about, this is not a practical example of natural memory, but I think it's one that helps illustrate the point of what I'm talking about. Consider the environment, consider a specific environment, that specific environment being one square meter of the beach. Okay, so imagine we're considering the environment of a one meter by one meter by one meter cube of sand on a beach. There's life that inhabits that environment, right? But the, the question to ask is, how long is the vector that fully specifies the state of that environment? That is to say, if we wanted to specify every degree of freedom described in, every degree of freedom contained in one square meter of beach, how many degrees of freedom do we need? Well, if I'm oversimplifying a little bit, in order to fully specify the state of that natural location, we would need to specify the position and the orientation of every grain of sand contained in that square meter of beach. So that's three degrees of freedom for position. That's three degrees of freedom for orientation. So that's six degrees of freedom per grain of sand. How many grains of sand are there? Well, as it turns out, based on a little bit of Googling, um, we could expect to find something like a thousand billion grains of sand in one square meter of beach. So that means the length of the vector that would be required to fully specify every degree of freedom in this highly simple environment, one square meter of beach, that vector would be 6,000 billion elements long. Life, all of the life that occupies that environment, acts on that vector to change it. 
my contention is that I will bet you that there are a huge number of those degrees of freedom that are invisible to that life. Life doesn't know or care if we change the orientation of some of the grains of sand, for instance. This is, a, this is a silly example, but I'm just trying to illustrate the point. But there exist all over the place these examples of natural null spaces, places where there exists a tremendous amount of degrees of freedom that are invisible to the life that inhabits that environment, but that maybe could be affected by our digital electronic computers. Maybe we could use our computers to put information in those systems, Life doesn't mind. And then maybe we can read that information back out from those systems. I want to offer you a few examples of this. These, fall in, these examples fall into sort of three categories. There's proof of concept categories. These are examples of natural memory that are probably not useful for one reason or another. Maybe they don't store that much memory, right? Or maybe they're really hard to read or really hard to write. But they illustrate the point. They, they prove the concept. I want to offer you another example that is, I think, of a niche application. And then some far out examples of where this, this idea could eventually lead. So what are some proof of concept examples of this? Well, one proof of concept example of natural memory is tree rings. As all of you are likely aware, if you cut down a tree and you look at the interior of the trunk, you'll find a collection of rings. And the spacing of those rings gives you information about the history of the environmental conditions, more specifically the growing conditions, that that particular tree uh, experience throughout its whole life until you cut it down. Um, and so it raises this interesting, I think this is interesting. What that means is that that tree is storing data. The data that it happens to be storing is the history of the environmental conditions. But let's suppose that that tree wasn't out in the forest, but instead lived in a greenhouse where the environmental conditions were highly controlled and the only variable in the environmental conditions, let's just suppose, were, was uh, water. That there was, in fact, a person who was responsible for watering that tree on a regular basis. If we were to allow for that tree to grow in those conditions and in those circumstances for 15 years, and then we cut it down and we looked at the tree rings, those tree rings would not be telling us about the history of the environmental conditions. Instead, they would be telling us about the history of the level of responsibility of the person who is, whose job it is, is to water that tree. <laughs> if we see the tree rings tightly spaced, it suggests that whoever was responsible for watering that tree was not doing a good job. That's the information that's being stored in there instead. Um, to take another sort of silly proof of concept example, suppose instead that that tree lived in a greenhouse and that the environmental conditions of that greenhouse were being controlled by some other source of data. So suppose we had some internet connected device that was, was you going out to the internet and grabbing some data point, I don't, GDP of the United States or whatever, and then using that data point to set the temperature and the humidity in the greenhouse. If we then, after 15, 20 years, cut that tree down and looked at the tree rings, the data stored in those tree rings would be the GDP of the United States, or whatever the data source was that we were using to modulate the environmental conditions. Again, this is, I'm, I'm offering this as a proof of concept example because this isn't a practical amount of information really, but it illustrates the points that there exist these repositories in nature where we could put data. Another example is ice cores. Ice cores, if you go to Antarctica and you do an ice core, that ice core, it, it, contains information about the environmental conditions right there above where you did the ice core going back eons. And so very similar to the tree, if you had some mechanism for controlling those environmental conditions above that ice core, what ends up getting stored in the ice, the data that ends up getting stored in the ice is in fact, whatever data we were using to modulate the environmental conditions. So, you know, this is not much data, but boy, is it non-volatile. <laughs> that data is going to last a long time, particularly if you put it in an ice core. Okay, so these are sort of somewhat silly proof of concept examples. You know, here's an example of a very old tree with a whole bunch of tree rings. The observation is just that this is an example of a natural repository for data. There exist other examples too. I can offer you a, another, maybe this is slightly more practical. Maybe this has some niche utility. There exists a whole interesting field of study called paleomagnetism. Paleomagnetism is the study of the history of the Earth's magnetic field. 
And one of the principal ways that researchers in this field study the history of the magnetic field of the Earth is by going to igneous rock, that is to say rock generated by volcanoes, and studying the orientation of the ferromagnetic crystals contained in that rock. And the reason that the orientation of those crystals give these researchers information about the history of the Earth's magnetic field is as that rock is cooling, all those little ferromagnetic crystals, like so many little compasses, will align themselves with magnetic north. And then once the lava cools below a certain temperature, that orientation is locked in. It can't change anymore. And so even if the position of the magnetic pole of the Earth moves, the orientation of those crystals in that lava do not move. The, the information about the position of the North Pole when that rock cooled is locked in. So suppose, so suppose that we built some interesting device, some big machine that we sat above a flowing river of lava that actuated the magnetic field incredibly quickly. If we did that, here's just a little picture of what this could look like. So imagine you have some volcano and there's a river of lava flowing down and it flows underneath our little magnetically actuated bridge. And what this thing is doing is creating strong magnetic fields in one direction or the other direction, which is turning all the little ferromagnetic crystals in the lava one direction or the other direction as they flow underneath. If we did this, right, so then as that lava cools, all those little orientations get locked into the lava, then we can store information, store data in this natural repository for information. If we then wanted to recover this information, we could start down at the base of the volcano and take our little compass. But this is, we would need more sophisticated equipment than this, but for illustrative purposes, you have a little compass. And as you walk back up the volcano, the compass would twitch this way, that way, this way, that way, this way, that way, giving you back all the ones and zeros that you would have stored here in the, in the orientation of the ferromagnetic crystals in this lava. So this is a little bit more data. It's extremely non-volatile. And then, so, so then there also exists some more sort of far out examples of places where we might eventually store information. Um, and this goes back to what I was saying previously. Everywhere in nature, nature has an unbelievable amount of state, an unbelievable amount of degrees of freedom. We talked about the amount of degrees of freedom contained in a single cubic meter of beach. How many degrees of freedom are there contained in the molecular state of a mineral? Um, how many degrees of freedom are there contained in, in, say, a coral reef? If we think about life, if your model for life is as a matrix which acts on a vector that contains all these degrees of freedom, we are free to store data in the null space of that matrix without having any adverse effect on local life. If only we can figure out how to read and write this, we can use nature's huge state space to store information. There is some evidence that this works. There is some evidence that this works. There has been and continues to be a bunch of research into storing information in DNA, writing information into DNA, and then reading information back from DNA. And I've, I've included a collection here of some of what I think are the most interesting papers on this topic. But folks have done things like store and recover pictures and movies in DNA, right? So. DNA, I would argue, is another example of this natural repository for information. It contains a null space. We are free to store data in that null space. Um, and the fact that this is possible with DNA suggests that perhaps it's possible with some of these other places in nature with tremendous amounts of degrees of freedom. Perhaps this suggests that it's possible to read and write some of those degrees of freedom in some other places in nature. So nature offers sources of compute. It offers sources of memory. And the last claim that I want to make here is that na nature also offers us mechanisms for moving data, moving, moving large amounts of data. And um, I'll start by making an, an, obvious, an obvious point, but one that's really worth pondering. Nature is really good, I mean really good, at moving huge amounts of matter over huge distances. So think about rivers, think about ocean currents, think about the trade winds, the jet stream, 
planets, moons, asteroids, water carbon cycles. That's a huge amount of matter moving. We as humans, this goes back to that original observation with, with which we started this whole presentation. We as humans have a long history of noticing that these are tremendously energetic processes. There's a huge amount of energy associated with the movement of that amount of matter. And we also have a long history of building mechanisms that allow for us to just sip a little bit of the energy contained in that system. For many of these systems, we don't even get, we do not even approach extracting the total amount of energy that it contains. We just take a tiny, tiny fraction of it. So think about things like hydroelectric dams, uh, wind farms, water wheels, and so forth. A wind farm, I mean, what fraction of the total energy contained in the wind does a wind farm extract? It's some tiny, tiny fraction, right? But we're sipping it. The, the, the point is that there's so much energy contained in these processes that even just sipping a tiny fraction of it gives us a bunch of energy to put towards other stuff, right? We have a long history of doing this. The observation is that anywhere that matter is moving, Anywhere that matters moving, information is also moving. And so the thought experiment is to think about these movements of matter as moving information. And I want to offer you again a perhaps silly thought experiment to illustrate this point. We can think about Niagara Falls. Humanity has a long history of noticing how much power is contained in big waterfalls like Niagara Falls, right? But Let's think about Niagara Falls in an information flow context. Um, there exist 1.26 times 10 to the 26 molecules of water in one gallon. And of course, each of these molecules has a position and orientation. Every second, 700,000 gallons of water flow over Niagara Falls, right? So that's this many, a number times 10 to the 32 degrees of freedom, about a zettabyte uh, of information that flows over Niagara Falls every second. The observation here is now, look, now and I know, <laughs> I know that, that it is ridiculous to imagine that we could meaningfully store information in a lot of these degrees of freedom. Entropy is a problem, right? These things are moving all the time. But the point is just, this is supposed to be a thought experiment where what we're asking ourselves, we're thinking about these movements of matter in an information kind of way rather than thinking about the energy contained in rivers, jet stream, and so forth, we're asking ourselves, what is the information channel capacity of things like the Nile? What's the information channel capacity of the jet stream? And much like the production of matter, or I'm sorry, of the, the production of energy, I mentioned that humanity has a long, hosp uh, a long history of just sipping the total energy available in these processes. Wind farms, right? They're, they're extracting a tiny fraction of the total amount of energy contained in the breeze. It is just as ridiculous to imagine that we could transfer a zettabyte of information through Niagara Falls as it is to imagine that we could extract all the energy from Niagara Falls or, or, or all the energy from the wind or all the energy from the sun or so forth. I know that there exists sort of interesting sci-fi examples of the engineered systems that might do this, but, but I think you take my point. The thought experiment instead is, what if we could just sip the total information channel capacity of these movements of matter in much the same way that we just sip the total energetic potential of these movements of matter? If we could do that, it might be the case that, that the amount of information that we could transfer would be tremendous because the total of amount of information that's flowing is so tremendous. I want to offer that I think that there are some near-term possibilities for this natural data transfer. And then, like with the other two things that we discussed, there are some sort of longer-term, far-out possibilities. In the near term, one very simple thing that we can do is, is we can make the observation that these movements of matter, they, they have the capacity to carry more matter with them. We can throw stuff into rivers, and the river takes it downstream. And so in the near term, we can add matter in the conventional of mass storage devices. So think things like SD cards, right? Just as a silly example. We can add matter to these systems such that they are swept along with all that matter from an origin to a destination. And in doing so, if we transfer information in that way, the information channel is bursty 
in the sense that all the information all the information will arrive sort of all at once. If I if I toss an SD card, you know, into the creek up here, and then you go down to Cayuga Lake and pick it out, right? All the information has arrived to you all at once. But what's interesting about this is the average data transfer rate for this mechanism of moving data is quite high. And again, as another another silly example of this, we can do this thought experiment where we ask, what is the data rate of a single pigeon, <laughs> a single pigeon flying from New York City to Boston? So let's imagine that we take a pigeon and we tie a bunch of SD cards to its legs. And yes, I did some sort of back of the envelope research about you know, how fast pigeons fly and how many SD cards could you fit on a pigeon leg and so forth. But as it turns out, you know, but pigeons fly remarkably fast. I was really surprised. As it turns out, if you strap a bunch of SD cards to a homing pigeon and you let it go in New York and it flies to Boston, the average data rate that you will get from that pigeon is three gigabytes a second. Three gigabytes a second. And there exist obviously systems in nature, places where data is moving with way more capacity for excess mass than a pigeon, right? So think about, think about the trade winds, the ocean currents, rivers, and so forth, right? It's possible that we could use these movements of matter to transfer data. And then in the long term, maybe, maybe possibly, we could encode the information that's being transferred in the matter itself. So we could identify these natural null spaces in this moving matter that are somewhat non-volatile, that aren't destroyed by entropy in the transfer process, and store data in the matter itself. And so how does this all start and where does this all lead? Um, in my view, if you look at the history of every flavor of computer, if you look at the history of every flavor of computer, history of digital computers, history of analog computers, they all start special purpose. And so I think that we'll see the same thing in natural computing, where the first natural computers will be natural computational accelerators. They will be systems that we identify in nature that are executing some algorithm efficiently and with which we can interface our natural computers to accelerate that particular algorithm that, that is being accelerated by that natural process. The first step of that is to go find these systems. So we engage in this computational naturalism. We go out into the, into the wild and we look for computers. We look for algorithmic processes. We look for repositories of data. We look for places where data is being moved. We study these systems. We gain an understanding of their, of their algorithmic qualities. And then we figure out how we might interface our computers with those systems. And then we start, as always, with special purpose computers, or as we have in the past. This will start special purpose. And maybe it's possible that this that we incorporate more and more and more natural processes into these, these computers. And maybe, maybe it's conceivable, I'm not sure if this is science fiction or not, but perhaps it's conceivable that we ultimately replace every component of this computer with a natural process, such that we have a fully natural general purpose computer built by evolution and physics. Then where does this all lead? Supposing that this isn't all just ridiculous. Um, it seems to me that if we were able to successfully incorporate natural processes into our computing machines, we, we would, as a consequence, incentivize their preservation. These natural places, which, which at present, many of them are preserved for environmentalist reasons and altruistic reasons, and that's, that's fabulous. I think it's possible that if we figured out how to tap these natural computational processes such that these places were devoted to doing computational work on our behalf, it may be the case that, that these places will be preserved for their computational utility. <laughs> you could imagine maybe going to a national park and there being a little sign that says, please don't step off the trail. A, a Monte Carlo analysis is running in these ferns over here, right, or something like that. And so I think it's conceivable too that if we were to sex successfully do this, unlocking this latent computational potential could change the world in, in a way that is not so dissimilar from the way that the world changed when we began to unlock nature's potential for the production of power, 
we would see total global compute increase radically. We would unlock all these computers that evolution and that physics have generated and, and enable ourselves to deploy them on interesting problems. And so the idea is that maybe eventually these beautiful natural places won't just be preserved. Well, hopefully they'll continue to be preserved for the beauty and the, the, the nature that they contain but also there will be an increased incentive to preserve these places because they represent tremendous sources of computational potential, tremendous sources of computers, of memory, and of mechanisms for moving data. Thank you all. I, I would love to talk about this. Like I said at the beginning of this whole talk, I don't yet know if these are good ideas or if this is just a good story, I don't even know if it's a good story. And so my goal here is hopefully to engage in conversation about this. Like I said, I'm not trying to convince you that this is correct. I'm just trying to lay out a collection of thoughts so that we can collectively decide, is there anything to any of these thoughts? Is there anything in here that should be allowed to mature or should these ideas instead be sacrificed to reason? Thank you.